This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective... Sherlock Holmes. And right now, I'd like to just briefly mention an idea you ought to try tomorrow night, just before you sit down to dinner. Just pour yourself a glass of that good Petri California sherry. Petri sherry is the perfect before dinner wine. Its cheerful, glowing amber color looks festive and, well, it sort of lends an air of importance to the occasion. And as for the wine itself, just taste it. That Petri sherry is not just ordinary wine, no, sir. One sip and you know that wonderful sun-ripened grapes went into its making. Yes, and you know that Petri Sherry was carefully watched over every step of the way. Incidentally, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. Regular sherry and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure just which kind you and your friends will like best, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But when it comes to sherry, or any other wine for that matter, be sure you always buy Petri. Now, I'm certain our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Burkell. Punctual to the minute, as always. <laughs> well, this is one doctor's appointment I'm eager to keep. <laughs> nice you to say so, my boy. Draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Well, Doctor, today is April the 1st. Did uh, anyone try and play any jokes on you? <laughs> yes, you did, Mr. Bartell, but I'm happy to say that nobody caught me. Uh, not as in the story that I'm going to tell you tonight, but an April Fool's Day prank, certainly it's called a bullseye. I see you have the dispatch box out again, Doctor. Been refreshing your memory? Yes, I have to start telling. When I tell you the adventure took place in 1881, I think you'll agree that after such a lapse of time, a man can hardly rely on memory alone. 1881? Say, Doctor, tonight's adventure must have been one of the really early ones. Yes, it was indeed. In fact, to be exact, it took place only a little while after Sherlock Holmes and I had first met and had taken up lodging together. How was the great detective in those early days? <laughs> it's a fine mystery to me, Mr. Bartell. To give you an example, my boy, I shared our Baker Street lodgings with him for over a month before I was even certain of his profession, the knowledge of which I learnt to my awe and astonishment, when our first adventure together took place. Well, that was the one you called a, a study in scarlet, wasn't it, That's Doctor? That's right, Mr. Bartell. The memory you got study in scarlet. Uh, but even after that adventure, I found myself wondering at times what I had let myself in for, sharing lodgings with such a strange companion. It was in one of those moods of doubt and confusion that my story begins. Late one March evening, I found myself in the neighborhood of Piccadilly Circus. It was cold... And a steady drizzle of rain had dampened my spirits. I thought that a glass of wine and the sound of music would put me in a better mood. And, and so, Mr. Bartell, I entered the Criterion restaurant. As I sat with a glass of rare vintage port at my elbow, the orchestra playing a dreamy Strauss waltz in the background, I couldn't help thinking of the last time that I'd been there. It was the night I met a young medical student by the name of Stamford. He was the man who first introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. Suddenly... I felt a clap on my shoulder. I turned, and to my amazement, once again, young Stamford was standing before me. Watson, or should I say Dr. Watson, how are you, my dear chap? Hello, Stamford. Come and sit down. Thanks. I'm glad to see that you're not holding any grudge against me. Why on earth should I do that? For introducing you to Sherlock Holmes. I've reproached myself ever since. I think he's as mad as a hatter. Not at all. He may be eccentric. In fact, I'll admit that he is eccentric, but he's an extraordinarily interesting fellow. He'll make a great name for himself as a private detective one of these days. You'll see if I'm not right, Stamford. I saw something about him in the paper the other day. Yes, I think that was the Larston Gardens affair, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes, it was. He's a brilliant man, Stamford. Quite brilliant. Mm. Though I must admit he's difficult at times. He works like a fiend as a rule, but occasionally a reaction sets in him for days at a time. He'll lie on our sofa, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. It's depressing, I must say. I think he takes himself too seriously. Yes, perhaps you're right. How would you like to join in a little plot? Plot uh, against Holmes? Yes, yes, uh, just a rag, you know. We thought it'd be rather fun. We? Murphy and I, we were just talking about it. I'll call him over. 
Murphy? Oh, is it Murphy? I, I've seen him before somewhere, haven't I? I'm sure you must have done. He's been round at the hospital, and any time you go into the British Museum, you'll find him there. Nice fellow, but dull. Definitely dull. Uh, yes, Stamford. Oh, uh, this is a friend of mine, John Watson. Uh, this is James Murphy. How do you do? I think I've seen you at the hospital. And I know I've seen you, Dr. Watson. Oh, sit down and come and join us, won't you? Oh, thank you very much. I was just telling Watson about our little plot. Oh, you, you, you mean about uh, Sherlock Holmes? Now, now, look here. I'd like you fellows to realize that Holmes is a very good friend of mine. Oh, don't worry, Watson. This is all in good fun. Don't you realize what the date is tomorrow? First of April, isn't it? Yes, April Fool's Day. Oh, no, I see. You're going to play an April Fool's Day joke on, on home. Yes, that's our plan. Well, it's hardly our plan, Stamford. It's really Lady Anne Partington's idea. You see, Holmes was very rude to her when she visited the hospital recently, and she wants to, uh, well, you know, take him down a peg or two. Oh, sounds innocent enough, but I must say he's inclined to be rather arrogant at times. Well, what's, what's the plan? Well, we'll need your help, Watson. You must be careful not to give the joke away. I'll bet you a fiver that Holmes falls for the whole story, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> now, here's exactly what we're planning to do. Lady Anne is going to call on Holmes at Baker Street in the morning. Lady Anne, I'm very flattered that you called to see me in my professional capacity. Surely, my dear man, you didn't think this was a social call. You were much too rude to me at the hospital the other day for that. <laughs> That was the point I was trying to make. Uh, please sit down, won't you? Please, uh, take this chair, won't you, Lady Anne? It's by far the most comfortable chair in the room. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, what can I do to help you? You've heard of the Elphinstone Emerald. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. A magnificent stone of very considerable value. An heirloom in your family, I believe. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I keep it in a wall safe in my bedroom. This morning, when I had occasion to go to the safe, I discovered that the emerald had been stolen. Stolen? It's cut. Shocking business. Of course, you want Mr. Holmes to recover it for you. A remarkable deduction, my dear doctor. Uh, Lady Anne, when you opened the safe, did you observe any signs of it having been tampered with? Oh, I, I think it's rather stupid to sit and answer questions here in Baker Street. Uh, why don't you come over to my house in Cavendish Square and examine the safe for yourself? Uh, you are a detective, aren't you? Uh, Lady Anne, uh, just now you accused me of rudeness. I assure you that mine, at least, was unintentional. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Don't be so touchy. I can promise you a substantial fee, Mr. Holmes. I'm a struggling practitioner and a new profession, eh? My poverty, but not my will, consents. I pay thy poverty and not thy will. You see, I can quote my Shakespeare, too, Mr. Holmes. My carriage is waiting, gentlemen. Let's drive over to Cavendish Square at once, shall we? <laughs> This is the wall safe, Mr. Holmes. Mm, not too difficult a safe to crack for an expert. You placed the emerald in it last night, you say? Yes, when I went to bed. And this morning, it had gone. Well, surely, Holmes, this is a good occasion to use that magnifying glass that you're always fitting about Excellent with. Excellent occasion, my dear doctor. That's why I brought it with me. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. What is it? This safe was opened by an expert. There isn't a sign of its having been forced. Hello. What have you discovered? There's a peculiar tarnish on the steel knob. It was obviously handled by someone whose fingers are habitually stained with chemicals. Amazing, Holmes. Let me mention, my dear doctor. Uh, where did that door lead to? My boudoir. I should like to examine it, if I may. Oh, but of course. Thank you, Lady Anne. Dr. Watson, this is the most beautiful April Fool's Day fraud I've ever played. Yes, I must say Murphy was right. He has fallen for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Just to say, I'm beginning to feel guilty. I can't help feeling a, a bit disloyal. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. It's all in fun. Are Stamford and Mr. Murphy listening? Yes, they're next door in my drawing room. I'm sure their ears are positively glued to the keyhole. Well, I do hope Holmes won't be angry with me. Here he comes. Nothing of any interest in there. The windows haven't been tampered with. We may presume, therefore, that the thief did not enter by an upstairs window. Uh, Lady Anne. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This room has not been touched since you discovered your loss. Oh, no. I told the servants to leave it exactly as it was while I came to fetch you. Splendid. Splendid. Deep file carpet, eh? Could be better. Uh, the thief was a tall man with a long stride. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. I know your methods, but there aren't any footprints on this carpet that, that you can identify. Even with your magnifying glass. My dear doctor, I've studied many crimes, and I've never seen one yet that uh, was committed by a flying creature. As long as a criminal remains on his two legs, there must be some, some trifling displacement to be detected by a keen observer. I assure you that the marks on this carpet indicate that the thief uh, was a tall man with a long stride. Mm. Faces of tobacco ash. Pipe tobacco. Stag tobacco that... 
sells at fourpence an ounce. <laughs> now, really, Mr. Holmes, how can you possibly identify an individual tobacco? Oh, it's a hobby of mine. In fact, I've even written a monograph on the subject. Now, one more look at the space itself. Hello. What's this part of dust here? What? It's rosin. The sweet trace of rosin. Lady Anne, I suggest that you get in touch with Scotland Yard at once. You mean that you've solved it, Holmes? I mean, my dear doctor, that I can give you a reasonably complete picture of the thief, and that picture is so individual that I'd be surprised if it would fit more than one man in London. Why, this is pure magic, Mr. Holmes. Please describe him to me. Uh, well, he's a tall man. The width of his stride indicates that, and he's thin. Well, what enables you to tell that, Holmes? His footprints have made a remarkably light indentation on the nap of the carpet. Our thief dabbles extensively in chemicals, as indicated by the tarnishing of the knob on the safe, and the traces of rosin would suggest that he plays the violin also. He smokes shag tobacco, has a great practical knowledge of the ways of combination locks, and he's obviously in close contact with the criminal classes. How do you know that, Mr. Holmes? Well, he wouldn't steal a famous stone unless he knew how to dispose of it through some trustworthy fence. Yes, it's a very comprehensive picture, Holmes. I almost feel as if I knew the chap. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sure there's only one man in London, and it shouldn't be hard to trace him. <laughs> <laughs> I agree entirely, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, I think the joke has gone far enough. Joke? <laughs> oh, what do you mean? <laughs> You're quite right, Holmes, in, in saying there's only one such man in London. You've just given a perfect description of yourself. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> Dr. Stamford, Mr. Murphy, you can come in now. April Fool, Holmes. April Fool. April Fool. April Fool. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> Into the drawing room, everyone. Let us drink a glass of wine to Mr. Holmes, who has so graciously forgiven us for the little trick we played on him. And also to Dr. Stamford, who thought of the whole idea. Uh, no hard feelings, Holmes. Oh, no, Doctor. No, it was a rather embarrassing experience. Yes, and Murphy told me about the plan. I, I just couldn't resist joining him. Ah, here you are, Holmes. Here's a drink. Thank you, Stamford. <laughs> you know Murphy, don't you? Uh, no, I don't think we've met. Oh. How do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do, Holmes? How did you like the little game we played on you? It was rather a salutary experience. I suppose you gave them all the details to build up the picture of me, eh, yes, Doctor? Yes, I did, Holmes, and knowing some of your methods, we tried to plant every clue that you'd pick up. <laughs> Very neat job, too, and incidentally, a perfect example of the dangers of deductions based on purely circumstantial evidence. I shall profit from this little lesson. I must say it was worth a fortune in Emeralds to see your face, Holmes, when you realized what you'd done. Well, the joke's over now. By the way, where is Lady Anne? I believe she said she was going to fetch the Orphanstone Emerald. She thought you might be interested in seeing it. She probably feels the sight of it will salve my wounded vanity. <laughs> oh, here she comes now. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! It's got... What's wrong? What's happened, Lady Anne? The Emerald. It's not where I hid it. This time it's really stolen. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, so I've just time to remind you that there are many, many different types of wine. But if you want one wine that's fine for almost any occasion, then you want Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is fine before dinner, of course. But Petri Sherry is good after dinner, too. And it's the perfect wine for cocktail time or any time friends drop in. Everybody will love the real heart-of-the-grape flavor you get in every sip of Petri Sherry. And you can serve Petri Sherry proudly because those letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, your April Fool Day plot kind of backfired on you, didn't it? Yes, it's about to tell it was a perfect example of the, uh, of the biter bit. <laughs> Well, what happened next? I suppose Sherlock Holmes went into action once again. That's uh, Mr. Bartell, and it gladdened my heart to see the change in the fuller. I confess I'd felt rather ashamed of my part in the prank, for I could see that Holmes' pride had been hurt. But now, with a definite crime before him, the difference was amazing. He suddenly became a dynamo, galvanized into action as he stood there, firing questions at the other members. And who beside yourself knew of this fresh hiding place? Both Murphy and I did. Yes. Uh, after we'd left our deliberate clues on the safe, we went with Lady Anne and saw her secrete the emerald in the top drawer of her dressing table. We thought it would be all right there. 
After all, as soon as the joke was over, I was going to put it back in the safe. Now, I think our wisest plan before we question the servants would be for each one of you who were in this April Fool's Day prank to submit to being searched. Holmes, surely you don't suggest that any one of us took the emerald? No, Stafford, I don't. Uh, but if any one of you four are not guilty, this will be a splendid way of proving your innocence. I say, steady, Holmes. You're not suggesting that Lady Anne stole her own emeralds, are you? Are you, Mr. Holmes? I'm suggesting nothing. But I may point out that the recent vogue for the insurance companies has provided another interesting motive for these so-called... I resent your insinuation. It's outrageous. Lady Anne, if I'm to recover your emerald, I must at least consider every possibility. The search is the most immediate practical action. Perhaps you'll retire into the next room while I persuade these gentlemen to submit to being searched. Very well, but but I think you're in danger of making a fool of yourself once again. No, w- wait, don't don't go, Lady Anne. A search won't be necessary. What do you mean, Murphy? I, I must throw myself on your mercy, Lady Anne. I confess that I stole the emerald. Murphy! After you put it in the drawer, Lady Anne, I... I slipped back into the room and took it out. Murphy, that's a criminal action. I I know it, but I'm poor. I need money desperately for my mathematical research. I knew the emerald was priceless, and I... Well, I couldn't resist the temptation to take advantage of a joke. Here, Lady Anne, here's the stone, and please don't prosecute me. Please don't. It'd be my ruin. May I examine the emerald, Lady Anne? Thank you. Well, Mr. Murphy, I won't pretend that I'm not deeply shocked. I must ask you to leave my house. But you won't prosecute me, will you? It was a moment's temptation. No, uh... No, I won't prosecute you. Holmes, what are you doing with the emerald? Well, knowing something of the deceptive ways of thieves, I came on this case fully prepared to test the emerald when I found it. Now, uh, a drop of this acid from this vial, so... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing? You'll injure the stone. Uh, No, uh, not if it's a true emerald. Uh Uh-huh, look at that. Good Lord, the acid's eating to the stone as if it was sugar. But then that means... It means, Lady Anne, that Mr. Murphy has just imperiled his honor and his freedom to steal a singularly beautiful fake. Mr. Holmes, this joke has turned into a nightmare. Is there no way of recovering my emeralds? I hope so, Lady Anne. I've been taking steps in their logical order. The servants have all been questioned. We've searched Mr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy. Yes, most humiliating experience. Made me feel like a criminal. Well, personally, I was only too thankful to submit to a search this time. I knew I had nothing to worry about. You yourself, Lady Anne, you you consented to being searched by the police matron that Holmes sent for? Only because he threatened to send for the police if I didn't. But distasteful though it was, I'd rather endure that than have this story on the front pages of the newspapers. And in spite of all these rather unfriendly proceedings, we've got exactly nowhere as regards finding the emerald. No, Stamford, but we have at least eliminated the possibility that the thief is secreting the jewel on his person. Mm. Still somewhere in these two rooms, eh, Holmes? I think so, though there is one remaining possibility. And that is? that the fake stone was substituted for the real emerald sometime before all of you engineered your April Fool's Day joke. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, that's not possible. I know it was the genuine emerald I took out of the safe this morning. How can you be sure? The substitute was an excellent imitation. Without a chemical test such as I performed, it would be hard to be certain. I can tell you why I'm certain. Last night, Papa came to dinner and brought a Mr. Vanderleider of Amsterdam. He examined the stone. And you'll agree that a jewel expert like that couldn't be fooled. That's true, Lady Anne. And what did you do with the emerald after Mr. Van der Leider left? I locked it in my safe and went to bed. Mm-hmm. I didn't unlock the safe again until Dr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy came here this morning. That settles it, then. The real emerald is still hidden somewhere in these two rooms. But where? That's the question. I must say it's completely mystifying. Well, let's go back to what we were all doing at the exact moment you came into the room, Lady Anne, and informed us of the loss of your stone. Now, we were... We were drinking a toast to you That's and... That's it. Uh, Lady Anne, hard thinking is, uh, well, it's thirsty work. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get you something. Uh, a glass of port, perhaps. No, no, thank you. But I, uh, I observe that you have a remarkably comprehensive assortment of liqueurs. I wonder if I might have a glass of creme de menthe. Oh, of course. I'll get it for you. Creme de menthe in the middle of the day, Holmes? I knew you were eccentric, but this really... Holmes, t- this bottle, it... It clinged as I picked it up. I thought it might, Lady Anne. There's something inside it. Allow me, madam. Thank you. I'm sure you won't mind if I waste this liqueur on the aspidestra. Oh, no, so. Lady Anne, allow me to restore to you the Elphinstone Emerald. 
Great Scott. Amazing. Fantastic. Ingenious. The one safe hiding place in the room. Where could a green gem be more effectively hidden than in a bottle of green liqueur? But who stole it? Who substituted the fake stone? Frankly, I don't care. The gem is restored. That's all that matters. Uh, I prefer not to go to court. Neither you nor I, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would show up in the best of lights. And my father would disapprove of this whole affair, I'm afraid. Just as you wish, Lady Anne. In either case, I shall expect your check for my services in due course. Criterion again, Stamford. Won't you come in and join us for lunch? Thanks, Watson, but I'll keep the cabin go on. I actually have a patient this afternoon. A rare and delightful experience for a young doctor, as you probably know. <laughs> as rare and delightful as a client is for a young detective, Mr. Yes. I quite understand, and I'm correspondingly grateful to you for your, your profitable hopes. I'm glad it was profitable for you. Personally, I feel pretty stupid about the whole thing. Well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, old fellow. Goodbye. 39 on Slow Square, Cabby. You're remarkably quiet, Mayford. Well, I, I'm afraid my conscience won't let me do much talking, Doctor. I'm heartily ashamed of myself. Well, thanks for the lift. I'll, I'll leave you traps. Oh, there. Nonsense, nonsense. You'll join us for lunch, Murphy. But, uh... No buts about it. I insist. Come on. Well, it's awfully nice of you. Oh, come, 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 Murphy. Any one of us can make a foolish mistake. It's just lucky that you didn't have to pay for yours. Monsieur wishes it, David. Yes, for three, please. This way, Monsieur. Does this table please you? Excellent, thank you. All right, George, I'm as hungry as a hunter. How about you, Murphy? No, I'm afraid I have very little appetite. This whole case has upset me dreadfully. You mustn't take it so much to heart, Murphy. Uh, By the way, Doctor, I'd like to have your opinion on the case. Who do you think staged the theft of the emerald today? Perfectly obvious to me. Lady Anne Farlington did it herself to collect the insurance money. If she hadn't, she'd have insisted on your finding the thief. But uh, you needn't worry, old chap. You get your fee all right, I'm sure of that. Oh, I'm not worrying about the fee. But I assure you, Lady Anne did not engineer that fraud today. You you, you mean that it was Stanford? Uh, tell him who was responsible, my dear Murphy. But how should I know? Oh, how? come now, Murphy. Let's not fence any longer. You did an excellent job, a superlative job. I was uh, almost sorry to spoil it for you. I don't think I understand you, Holmes. Oh, yes, you do, Murphy. You're a splendid actor, too. I was so deeply touched when you had apparently stolen a fake jewel and... Uh, all the time you knew that the real one was safely hidden in the bottle of creme de menthe. To be abstracted at uh, your leisure. Ha <laughs> ha, you scoundrel. Holmes, do you mind telling me what's going on here? I'm completely and absolutely in the dark. Surely it's obvious, my dear doctor. The imitation emerald was a brilliant copy. What makes you so sure of that, my dear Holmes? Because this April Fool's Day hoax was only conceived yesterday, or that is what you wish the others to believe. Such a superb paste gem could not have been made at such... Short notice. Therefore, it must have been prepared by someone who knew about the hoax before it was arranged. Now, my dear doctor, when Stamford told you about the plan last night, whose idea did he say it was? He told me that it was Lady Anne Partington's plan. Precisely. And yet Lady Anne referred to it today as Stamford's idea. Obviously, you, my dear Murphy, presented the plan to each as the notion of the other, and so only you could have arranged the real theft behind the hoax. I repeat, (laughs) a splendid job. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. May I, uh, may I also compliment you on your cleverness in frustrating my plot? Look here, what is all this? One of you is a criminal, the other is a detective. Yet you're throwing each other compliments as if you were in the same profession. The dividing line between the criminal and the criminal investigator is thinner than you might imagine, my dear doctor. How very true, my dear Holmes. Would you consider coming over to my side of the line? Together we'd make an unbeatable team. Oh, oh. oh you flatter me. Nevertheless, I must decline your offer, Mr. Murphy. Oh, a pity. On your side of the line, you'll never be a rich man. By the way, for your edification, my name is not Murphy, though Stamford insists on thinking it is. Then what is your name, you scoundrel? (laughs) Your friend says the word scoundrel so much better than you, Doctor. Uh, My name? My name is Murphy. Oh, indeed. Uh, Spelled M-U-R-T-R-Y? No. Dear me, I have so much trouble with my name... People will either misspell it or mispronounce it. I'm afraid I'll have to begin calling it the way it looks. M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y. Moriarty. Moriarty. I shall remember that name. I have a feeling we shall meet again. I trust that we shall. 
You've won the first round, Sherlock Holmes. I admit that. But I believe that um, a return match is indicated. I shall look forward to it, Moriarty. And now, Doctor, I can't stand your bill for Claire any longer. Let's order lunch, shall we? Tucker, that was a pretty hectic April Fool's Day. It was. I never want to see another one exactly like it. I don't blame you. You know, I'd sure hate to have someone come to my house and pull a trick like that on me. Why, Mr. Bartell, do you have a precious emerald you, you fear may be stolen? Are you kidding? <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference between a precious emerald and a piece of green glass. But when it comes to rubies, now that's something else. Oh, you would know a ruby when you, when you saw it. Sure. Because a ruby has exactly the same color as a glass of Petri California port held up to the light. Mr. Bartell, you can find more excuses for talking about Petri wine than any man in the entire world. Believe me. Excuses, Doctor? <laughs> I don't need an excuse to talk about Petri wine. Why, there's a wine that actually speaks for itself. If I may borrow a phrase from Shakespeare or somebody. There's no other wine quite like Petri wine because only Petri wine is made by the Petri family. And the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been handing down from father to son, from father to son, years and years of knowledge and experience of the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Yes, and because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, those letters P-E-T-R-I on a bottle of wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. You never miss with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what's the prescription for next week? Well, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a rather unusual story. It concerns a series of strange disappearances and a murder without apparent reason. And yet, it was a case that Sherlock Holmes solved without ever meeting any of the suspects. I call it the singular affair of the disappearing scientist. Well, I'm sure we'll all want to hear that one, Doctor. Oh, I'm sure. Well, we got to... Oh, well, before you go, Mr. Bartell, I want to urge our friends to do all they can to save on the use of all wheat and rice products and also fats and oils. There are millions of families literally starving to death in Europe and Asia. They're not being asked to give them our food. They're just being asked to take it easy on certain foods so that there will be some left for them to buy. I know there isn't one person listening to me tonight who would knowingly let anyone starve. And remember, unless you do help, thousands of little children will starve. So please, let's share a meal and save a life. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.